I purchased a lot of gaming hardware this year. I want to talk about what I love, what I liked, and what didn't quite measure up. Today's video is going to be a little bit of an office tour, a little bit of a go buy stuff with my Amazon affiliate links, and a little bit of looking back at what I consider to be some of my best hardware purchases in the past years. So if you're building the ultimate gaming room or the ultimate setup, you can see what worked and didn't work for me. Now first things first, I haven't done an office tour since I moved up to Washington State over two years ago. This office here has been a little interesting to work in. I put in two large display cases for some of my Lego collecting, which also created a little too much reverb with the recording. So I really kind of had to go overboard with some of the sound foam around the office to get that under control. Over here, I have a sound blanket, which covers a double-sided closet. And I've run my dual PC setup into the closet closet with a big hose of cables. This keeps my office cooler, especially in the summer, making it way more pleasant to game in. Now as for my desk setup, I used to have a truss system that I built that a lot of people thought was pretty cool so that I could hang lights, cameras, and even mount two bigger studio speakers from, but ultimately it became a little redundant with some of the better gear that's hit the market, so I'm kind of back to a more traditional setup which has made it easier to work around. So let's talk about the desktop and my more recent hardware additions. All the hardware mentioned here will be linked in the description. If there's an Amazon link, it'll be an affiliate link and using them when buying gear will support my channel so thank you in advance if you do so. Now front and center the new main monitor that I use for gaming and editing is a Gigabyte M32U which is a 32 inch 4k 144 hertz refresh rate super speed IPS display. Now I knew that the CPUs and GPUs coming out this year was going to make 4k high refresh rate gaming way more plausible so I wanted to get ready for it. This Gigabyte screen is an extremely well priced model considering what you get from it at around 600 bucks i get pretty much everything i want from a top tier gaming display the colors are fantastic the response time is very competitive even downscaling to 1440p works great and playing at native 4k looks stunning now I've had a 4K 27 inch display in the past and I personally don't think it's really worth doing it at that size and the new 32 inch screens are really the sweet spot for 4K gaming. On the left we have an old BenQ TN display just for the extra screen space but on the right we have a brand new display that is great for streaming but in all honesty it's pretty overpriced. The monitor is a special LG Nano IPS dual up monitor that's actually designed for vertical viewing. It's got a bizarre 2560 by 2880 resolution. I got this because turning a display sideways, even in IPS, will still often give reduced image quality and functionality. So if you want something built for vertical viewing, this is one of the few options that I've found. It's kind of neat as you can actually have it function as either two displays or a single tall desktop. Now, is it worth the price? Well, that's for you to decide, but if you want a vertical display to help with screen space and reading stream chat better, this is a great option. But it can certainly be replaced with a less convenient and more affordable approach of just turning a monitor on its side. It did come with its own monitor arm though, which is kind of cool. Now when it comes to upgrades inside my PC, I made two massive upgrades to my rig this year. First was a CPU quote unquote downgrade to the cheaper 5800X 3D CPU. I replaced a higher clock, higher core CPU with this new 3D cache chip, and it's honestly been amazing how much better performance I get in games. It's been one of the easiest CPU upgrades ever. I literally just swapped the chip out and nothing else. Star Citizen got almost a 100% performance increase in certain areas of the game, which is absolutely crazy from a single chip being swapped out. Now to be fair, it is slightly slower in rendering out YouTube videos as it doesn't have as many cores as my previous chip but since I usually only render once per video and it's a marginal difference, it was certainly worth the upgrade for the gaming side of things. Next year, I'll be looking at the new X3D chips from AMD. Sadly, upgrading to those is probably going to be a lot more expensive, so the cheaper 5800X3D CPU will probably remain as one of the best value buys for quite some time. Now, the other system hardware upgrade was actually given to me by Nvidia through a sponsorship. I didn't buy this one with my own money, but given the chance, I probably would have. And that's the RTX 4090. Say what you will about Nvidia and the 40 series GPUs, if you're looking for raw brute force performance at any price, the 4090 will get you there. 
The new DLSS 3 stuff is also extremely impressive, and I hope to see more games support that tech soon. Now, I'm not saying that you need to have one of these cards in your system, but if you're a performance freak, this is probably already on your radar. If you're looking for something cheaper, I'd certainly keep my eyes peeled on the new AMD cards coming out as they seem like they're going to be priced more affordably, or the old 30 series GPUs can be had at decent discounts nowadays, especially if you're shopping on eBay. Now, peripheral wise, I did just upgrade to a new Razer Death Adder version 3 Pro. Wireless gaming mice really is the way to go these days since their latency has been on par with wired mice and the new Death Adder has such crazy long battery life plus optical switches which I'm hoping will last a long time. Gaming all the time can wear down mechanical switches sometimes and I've run through multiple hundred dollar plus gaming mice over the span of a single year so I'm hoping that these new optical switches hold up. So far it's fantastic and exactly what I want from a Death adder, I highly recommend it if you're in the market for a new mouse. Now on the odd side of things, I got a separate USB numpad this year. I've always liked 10 keyless keyboards for gaming as it gives me more mouse pad space and most games don't really need the numpad. However, as I've been playing more Star Citizen, you kind of need to use the numpad for a bunch of things, so I wanted to get one that I could just move out of the way when I didn't want it. This one is pretty basic, it's made by Magic Force and it works well. If you're looking for mouse pad space options, this is one way to go. Now my big peripheral purchases this year were the VKB dual joysticks. Done are the days of my old Thrustmaster Warthog stick, though I do still keep the throttle around as it's fantastic, but the new era of joysticks are truly next level with customizable gimbals and springs. They feel incredible and they're fully tunable to exactly what type of game you're playing. They also cost more than a freaking console each. For games like Star Citizen though, they are absolute game changers, adding a new sense of immersion and a huge fun factor when flying through the verse. On the right, I have the VKB Modern Combat Grip Ultimate with a VKB Gunfighter Mark III base. This is arguably one of the best joysticks on the market, with Verpal being another strong contender. On the left, I have the VKB Space Combat Grip and Gunfighter Mark III base, and below, I have the VKB t rudders when combined, all three of these peripherals give me unparalleled control in Star Citizen, a game that basically created the market for HOSA setups. That stands for Hand on Stick and Stick, as opposed to HOTOS, which stands for Hand on Throttle and Stick. And again, say what you will about Star Citizen, but learning to fly in this game with dual sticks is an experience unmatched in any game, and I think there's a lot of other dual stick users out there that would back up this statement. Now the mask for these sticks comes from a little company called Predator Mounts. There's all kinds of ways to set up joysticks and I wanted a way that fit with my normal gaming sticks so that I could easily switch between games without any fuss and this placement works out great. The mounts are very affordable and highly customizable. I'm a huge fan. And of course, if you're going to play flight sims or space sims, an eye tracking setup is a real game changer. I've got the Toby eye tracker at the bottom of my screen. I can't imagine playing Star Citizen without it. Being able to look around the super detailed cockpits, track targets and dogfights and look down when landing is absolutely key. It would be fantastic if more mainstream games started to incorporate eye tracker support. Like I could easily see Battlefield being really fun if the choppers let you look around from first person and the jets did. It would really just add a new sense of immersion and ways to play the game. Now I wish that those were some of the more expensive buys of this year, but I also bought a new gaming chair. It was time to get something new and I thought I would treat myself this time around. I've never owned a Herman Miller before, so I went for the new Herman Miller Embody Chair. It's supposedly designed more for gamers, but I'll be honest, I wasn't initially happy with the chair. The customization and overall design is fantastic, but the seat was very hard and at least at first, my legs and glutes would fall asleep when playing for extended periods of time. I actually got used to it now and that doesn't happen anymore, but I really don't know what to make of it overall. Ultimately, I do like the chair, but I'd be more curious about the tried and true Aeron or one of their new sail chairs. I've seen similar complaints online regarding the seat of this one as well, and it can be really hard to judge chairs in stores sometimes as it just doesn't become uncomfortable until you've been sitting in this one for a long period of time. Also, the lack of mesh backing means that you could end up with some back sweat if you're really locked in there. So, fair warning, I wouldn't recommend this chair, but I have heard good things about the Aeron if you want to spend some real money. 
Now, I did remove the armrest from the chair because I still use my old Ergo rests. I've had these desk mounted armrests for a long, long time. I got them to solve the problem of chair armrests where you would either chafe a lot for lots of mouse movements or mismatch armrest height with the desk, which was always annoying. These things are a perfect gaming product and in my opinion, I can't imagine gaming without them. Now, as for the rest of what's on my desk, I've still got the Audio-Technica AD700X headphones. They provide a great soundstage for positional audio and the open back offers nice breathability. They also fit my giant sized head nicely, which most headsets don't. Now, when it comes to audio mixers or digital audio converters, I still have my RME Babyface Pro and the RME Digiface. These guys were expensive. Back when I first bought them, I considered them to be big hardware investments, and they've been highly reliable and high quality. They give me all the inputs I need and allow for minimal cable running when transferring multiple audio streams back and forth between two PCs. Now, my reference speakers have seen quite a bit of a downgrade with these more basic creative desktop speakers, but if I'm being totally honest, the sound that they produce is surprisingly rich and it allows me to remove my headphones for basic browsing, music listening, and even editing. Honestly, they're pretty impressive for 20 bucks. And they kind of solve the problem of not really having a good place to mount reference speakers on a desk that has three monitors. You sort of take up the ideal locations and these ones are perfect. Now, for quite a while, my work mouse has been a Logitech Vertical MS Wireless. This is a fantastic mouse for editing and heavy click workloads. It helps massively with ergonomics and repetitive stress issues. My keyboard is a Razer Black Widow Lite. If I'm being totally honest, I think most gaming keyboards are just way overpriced for what you get. And I think Razer's cheaper keyboards are a bit better value and I don't really need any macro functionality or weird features, so this one was perfect for my needs. Now I'm still using my original Elgato Stream Deck for streaming and I've got one of the newer key lights from them, which I have to say actually beats the heck out of any similarly priced desk mountable light. It's got tons of features and functionality and is designed perfectly for what I need. Camera wise, I've got an Overkill XC10 4K, which is sort of a DSLR style Canon camera. I basically bought two of these for video work in my Lego studio and we only ended up really needing one. So now it's just a super high end webcam on a Gorillapod. Microphone wise and what you're listening to right now, I'm still using the legendary Shure SM7B on a Rode mic arm. The mic has been fantastic and is an easy recommendation for streaming and podcasting. It manages to cut out most EMI from noisy LED keyboards and stuff, which I can't say is true for other expensive studio microphones. So this one is great for operating in an LED intensive environment. So basically that's my office, my hardware, what I found to be good purchases and what you may want to pass on. I hope you enjoyed this video. And again, the best way to support content like this is to use the Amazon referral links in the description when looking to make a purchase. Let me know in the comments what your favorite gaming hardware or furniture upgrades have been. And if you're looking for something completely different, check out this Warhammer Dark Tide video where I link up with some YouTube veterans for a pitch black mission. As always, thanks for watching. And I'll see you next time. This is Level Cap signing off.